On tonight's episode, Taxi Driver, unarguably one of the greatest character pieces ever put to film. A sinister tone is set up straight away as ominous horns welcome in a smoke obscure cab. The title sequence then creeps in and this just gives us the feeling this is going to be an intense ride right from the beginning. De Niro's performance is subtle but incredibly effective. We know from the beginning that he has this sinister streak deep within him. The camera then pans up, drawing our attention to his minute mannerisms and his incredible ability to act. I don't trouble with guys like you come in and break my chops all the time. If you're gonna break my chops, you can take it on the arches right now, you understand? Sorry, sir, I didn't mean that. 1970s New York City is a big character in this movie. We see the dirt and the grime and the crime and the violence on the street and Travis's disassociative voiceover lets us know immediately that he's disgusted by this environment and all the people within it. Whores, skunk pussies, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies. Sick, venal. Robert De Niro is considered one of the greatest actors of all time and for good reason. I mean, he's been in some of the best movies ever made. This, Godfather Part 2. Raging Bull, Goodfellows, to name a couple, <laughs> there's a whole slew of many more. And yeah, back in the day, he was very much a method actor. He worked as a real life cabbie in New York City for two weeks to prepare for this role. And while he was on set, he was very much Travis. There were some other cast members who his character didn't get along with in the script, so De Niro wouldn't interact with them and he would very much blank them and not want to be friends with them because he thought it would hurt his performance and his performance is amazing, it's completely believable but it's not over the top, he's not like acting like crazy, it's just all these subtle nuances in his performance that are so believable and charismatic and engaging. Do you want me to call the manager? Oh, you don't have to call the manager, I mean, I'm just asking. Troy! Alright, okay. Yeah. Can I have a chuckle, sir? Travis begins a one-sided voyeur relationship with this beautiful woman. He stalks her and follows her and watches her. His inability to mirror normal human behavior becomes more and more apparent as this narrative marches forward. That taxi driver's been staring at us. The cinematography and rather slow pace give this movie a very film noir feeling. It takes the time and effort to show long stretches of the cab just driving in its element and with the accompaniment of Bernard Herrmann's smooth jazz score you just get this dreamlike feeling. Peter Boyle plays a character called Wizard in this movie. For those who don't know that name, he was Raymond's father and everybody loves Raymond. Not saying it was one of my favourite shows, but unfortunately I think I watched it a lot as a nine-year-old and I can only see Raymond's dad when I watch him in this film, unfortunately. It kind of pulls me out a bit. Same with Monster Ball, which is another great movie, which he does another amazing performance in. But yeah, unfortunately I just could not not see Raymond's dad when he was on camera. I'm shoving on. Uh, what? Can I talk to you for a second? There's this incredibly brilliant sequence where Travis's colleagues are talking to him but he just zones out and watches this antacid bubble away in his drink. I get a somewhat Vietnam veteran PTSD feeling from it, like he's seeing more, he's seeing these visions, he's having this moment. But maybe this was just here to show us that he's not connecting with his colleagues, he's not engaging in conversation with them, he's a loner, he's separated from normal humanity. Either way, I, I just love it. Love this so much. Travis puts on his best suit and confronts his love interest. And during this confrontation, he actually comes across rather charismatic and likeable. So Betsy, who is his love interest, agrees to go on a date with him. I saw in your eyes and I saw the way you carried yourself that you're not a happy person. And I think you need something. 
And if you want to call it a friend, you can call it a friend. During Travis and Betsy's date, his creepiness slightly emerges. He subtly berates one of her co-workers, telling her that he's better than him. It's obviously very jealous behaviour and somewhat aggressive, but Betsy doesn't seem to be concerned with him so far. His energy seems to go in the wrong places. When I walked in and I saw you two sitting there, I could just tell by the way you were both relating that there was no connection whatsoever. Jodie Foster plays a 12-year-old prostitute in this film? Dark, eh? Yeah, so she was 12 years old and she portrays this prostitute on the streets. There was an actual real-life prostitute in New York that Scorsese and the writer would um, pay to have lunch with and they tried to get her and Jodie to go to lunch together so she could match some of her characteristics, but they never really connected. I guess, what is a 12-year-old and actual real-life prostitute going to have in common? Not a whole lot, hopefully. Anyway, because of the fact that Jodie was 12, she had to have her mum on set with her and there were a whole bunch of restrictions around how long they can shoot and what they could show her doing. So her sister actually stood in as a double for her in a lot of the more sexually explicit scenes. Either way, as always, Jodie Foster is a brilliant actress in this movie. <laughs> For their second date, Travis takes Betsy to a porno theatre. Yeah, at first I thought this was meant to show Travis just completely incapable of reading social situations and just being a complete sociopath. But through further examination, I don't think this is the case. I think he knew it was inappropriate, but he was self-sabotaging because that's who he is. He builds up his life, but because of his loathing nature towards himself, he has to rip it all down and destroy it for himself. We also see him talk about his health and fitness and try to get back into shape, but then contradict this by drinking bourbon with breakfast and constantly popping pills. He's this walking contradiction that laments and resents the filth on the streets of New York City, but then lives in a squalor. It's a very interesting and complex character which I think mirrors real life people and a lot of real life, I don't know what you call them, sociopaths, yeah I guess, but also just self-loathing, depressed, lonely people. Well yeah, I mean I come and they are, this is not so bad. They can do a place like know. this is about as exciting to me as saying let's fuck. This is one of the most memorable camera movements in this entire film. Travis is on the phone trying to console Betsy after their horribly failed date and it just pans randomly into this hallway. At first you think something's going to happen, but nothing happens. It could almost be seen as a mistake in the first viewing, but obviously it was purposeful. I mean, this is Scorsese. <laughs> he doesn't make blatant accidents like that. So I think it was just trying to invoke Travis's paranoia or just separate the audience from him even further. Either way, I like it. It's odd, and weird, and it's different, and it works. You didn't get them, but I sent uh, some flowers. Uh... Rejected, Travis becomes more violent and isolated. He approaches Betsy's work and accosts her verbally. This begins a slow descent into his eventual violent acts. Okay, okay. Your hand off. okay then just leave. Hang on. All right, just leave then. Come on! I'm gonna tell you no, you're in a come hell. on! You're in a hell, and you're gonna die in a hell like the rest. Come on now! Scorsese himself actually portrays this vengeance-filled husband in this sequence. He's talking about buying a gun and shooting his wife for cheating on him. This wasn't meant to be Scorsese. The actor who was meant to play this character actually hurt himself in another film. So at the last moment, Scorsese had to do it. But either way, this is an important moment. It seeds the idea of vengeance in Travis's mind, and it kind of gives him the push to himself buy a gun and act out violence. I'm gonna kill her. I'm gonna kill her with a 44 Magnum pistol. I have a 44 Magnum pistol. I'm gonna kill her with that gun. Did you ever see? Did you ever see what a 44 Magnum pistol would do to a woman's face? I mean, it would fucking destroy it. The idea of political assassination runs completely through this film, and as Travis slips further and further from reality, this scene takes on a very ominous tone. We are the people. What I said to let the people rule, 
I felt that I was being somewhat overly optimistic. I must tell you that I am more optimistic now than ever before. The narrative isn't particularly quick or fast-paced. This movie is incredibly immersive and engaging. But even this sequence, where in a normal thriller the pace will start to pick up, it doesn't really. Travis goes in and buys four guns, but it's not shot quick or with energy and there's no music. The guns are almost shot like a love sequence. Travis is admiring them and the movie just kind of drifts along with incredible tension and suspense, but there's no real quick pace or thrust towards this confrontation. We then get a great montage of Travis preparing himself mentally and physically for his moment, his swan song. De Niro's body is muscular but incredibly thin and disgusting but fucking violent and it, it just, it looks frightening and this whole sequence really makes you believe that this guy is fucking mad, eh? Also makes me think that I need to get back into shape. One day, one day, not today, tomorrow. There'll be no more pills, there'll be no more bad food, no more destroyers of my body. From now on, it'll be total organization. Every muscle must be tight. There are lots of little weird oddities within the editing and filming of this movie. This is one of them. There's this like retake scene where uh, Travis's character fails to uh, present this monologue to himself while in his room and the editing just clicks back to the beginning and it almost looks like a mistake. Obviously it's not, but I just love these little odd interesting moments. You don't have to do everything by the books. Trying to be different can pay off a lot of the time, especially when you score Stacey, obviously. Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. Who would not let... Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Duffel coat, hunting knife, and many a cannon in hand, Travis goes to a political rally, but ultimately just scopes the scene and leaves without lashing out. Be careful today. Right, we'll do. You have to be careful if you've been around a place like this. Bye. The context of this film has changed in the last 40 years. I think in the current American political climate of constant school shootings more and more than anyone could have ever believed would have been possible in the 70s. If this film came out now, there'd be a lot of controversy like there was with Joker. But this movie is even darker and pushes it even further to the limit and doesn't glorify Travis, but I'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Either way, this film does have a different context watching it in 2019 to watching it in 1975, although it was very controversial and violent when it came out as well. You talking to me? There's no one else here, so you must be talking to me. This is burnt into all of our minds through pop culture and it was improv. In the script, it just called for De Niro to talk to himself in the mirror, so Marty just shot it and just kept on shooting and kept on rolling and De Niro just rolled and just made it up on the spot. It's amazing how one of the most iconic scenes in film history De Niro just came up with in the moment. You talking to me? You talking to me? Loneliness echoes through this film. Travis is constantly popping pills and is completely unable to connect with anyone on a human level. The airy, dreamy cinematography and score also echo this dreamlike feeling. This movie also has a lot of racist undertones. Travis being a Vietnam vet seems to push his paranoia towards African Americans and people of low socio-economical backgrounds. <music> Unknowingly walking into a robbery, Travis coldly and calmly calls hey to this guy and then shoots him with no remorse. It's an incredibly haunting and dark scene to see our main character just take someone's life and not care about it at all. Not so sadness or remorse or even happiness or excitement. Just kill someone and believe that they deserved it. Yes, 
o'clock, you got more bread. That's it, man. Give me the rest hey. of the fucking bread. Hey. The narrative at this point, after the second act, does start to pick up as Travis slips further and further from reality. He lies in a letter to his parents telling them that he has a great job and he's been in a relationship with a woman for some time. He destroys his TV, he burns all these flowers that Betsy sent back to him, and De Niro's performance is completely believable. You can 100% see him as this psychotic New York outcast. Travis hires Iris, Jodie Foster's character, in an attempt to gain insight into her world. In his mind, he's the only one who can save her from this horrific world of pain and childhood prostitution. Some action? Yeah. You see that guy over there? Yeah. Right. You go talk to him, his name is Matthew. Harvey Keitel plays Jodie Foster's pimp in this movie in one of his most memorable roles. He matched uh, his mannerisms and characteristics of his local pimp who lived in his neighborhood in Hell's Kitchen around this time, which is pretty funny. The hat and the wig and the long pinky nail for coke apparently was modeled after this pimp who lived down the road from him. I just love that. And as always, Harvey Keitel is amazing. It's an action. Officer, I swear I'm clean. I'm just waiting here for a friend. You gonna bust me for nothing, man? I'm not a cop. To Bickle's dismay, Iris does not want to be saved from her social situation. She's quite contempt. And once again, Travis is unable to be effective in the real world. He just can't function or help or provide any positivity to this world. He's just stumbling along in a dark environment that he does not understand and cannot connect with. No, I don't want to make it. I want to help you. Well, I can help you. Damn, man! In the only scene in the movie not shown from Travis's perspective, we see Harvey Keitel's character and Jodie Foster's character having this incredibly creepy and odd but somewhat touching moment. It reflects real life and how complex it is. Obviously this pimp is exploiting this 12 year old girl and is violating her in extreme, extreme ways, but he does seem to have affection for her and she does seem to have affection for him as well. It's quite realistic in how grey it is. Now when you're close to me like this, I feel so good. From the burning ashes of the flowers that had been returned to him, Travis emerges as this new character who will in his mind write the world. We get this great just camera, just steady on De Niro with his head cut out, then it quickly jars and pans up, revealing his new violent look with shock to the audience. It's great, and the image of him and De Niro's demeanor really does instill a sense of tension and fear. Long roads have led us into war, into poverty, into unemployment and inflation. Today I think. After failing to execute this political assassination that Travis has been planning, he decides to focus all his rage and vengeance on Iris's pimp. This starts this incredibly bleak and violent scene that just unravels in front of our eyes. Fuck out of here, man. Get out of here. Suck on this. Oh, oh. In a sequence completely void of music, Bickle enters this prostitution house and begins to execute all of the criminal occupants. All the practical blood splatter effects and the practical hands and everything are so great. They don't look particularly real, but I just love their aesthetics. I hate CGI blood splatters and CGI hands. If you can do it with practical effects, do it. I, I don't know, it may not look realer, in a lot of cases it does, but I just love the aesthetic way more. The thing, I mean, the practical effects in that are better than any CGI in any movie. Don't get me wrong, there is a time to use CGI for particular things, to touch up things more so than just completely immerse the screen in it. But, I just... 
blood splatter effects. They have to be real, they have to be practical. They can't be CGI, they look garbage if they're CGI. And this film is now timeless because these effects were practical. Hey! Travis is not portrayed as a hero in this confrontation. It's all shot very flat and stark and realistic and as I said, completely void of music. He doesn't come across as a hero liberating a small girl. He comes across as a vicious murderer acting out these horrific actions. Oh man, this headshot as Iris screams out for mercy is so dark, is so brutal, is so violent, but is so good. His master plan now executed, Travis turns the gun on himself, only to find empty chambers. This is yet another reminder that this is not an action hero, but a mentally ill Vietnam veteran lashing out of the world. Police officers show up to the scene and Bickle gives this gesture, which is one of the most iconic in cinematic histories, and it's also been etched into my mind for close to a decade. So good, so iconic, so memorable. We then get this brilliant bird's eye view tracking shot of all the bloody aftermath and the way that they accomplish this was simply by cutting the floor out of the floor above them with chainsaws and mounting a camera to a dolly and just filming it. But what happened was this building was so old and so decrepit in the middle of New York City that they cut all the foundation beams and started to split apart. So they put scaffolding on the outside of it just to hold the building back together. And then they ran out of time and they only had 20 minutes to shoot this incredibly beautiful sequence. But Scorsese managed to do it because, hey, he's a good filmmaker. <laughs> no, he fucking is. Though. In the wake of this vigilante escapade, Travis is praised by the press. Congratulations rain down on him. He learns no lesson and his violent disassociative behaviors are only cemented. This is a commentary that the writer wanted to talk about because more and more in media in the 70s, these shooters, these political assassinators were being more celebrated and glorified in the media and he didn't understand it, obviously. Didn't agree with it, obviously. So this movie has a really bittersweet ending with Travis learning nothing and being the same person that he was when he started. A fucking violent psychopath. Needless to say, you are something of a hero around this household. I'm sure you want to know about Iris. She's back in school and working hard. The last scene of the movie is Travis back at his job after this whole events have transpired and Betsy gets in the cab. She's only shot through the rear vision mirror and it has a very ethereal dreamlike feeling. Some people have speculated that this was a paranoid delusion by Travis and she never actually got into the car. I could go either way. I mean, maybe she'd get in the car. Maybe she did see all the praise for him in the press and decided to give him another go. Or maybe he's a crazy person. I mean, yeah, no, he is a crazy person. We haven't seen him have paranoid delusions before, but Sure, sure it could be a vision. This movie was incredibly, incredibly violent for its time and the rating board didn't want to release it. They thought it, it, it took violence way too far. So they made the film editor and Scorsese desaturate all the colors in the final scene so the blood wasn't brilliant and bright and eye-catching, but it's all dark and cloudy and contrasted and sepia-tony. And unfortunately, during the Blu-ray or the DVD release, they wanted to get the original negatives from the film and show this in its full original brilliance, but the film had disintegrated and was no longer functionable. I feel like you could just 
put it digitally into a computer and color grade it to make it more brilliant and vibrant how it was originally supposed to be seen. But as far as I know, that hasn't happened. Still, the ending sequence is amazing. In conclusion, what more can I say about this movie? I've probably rattled on for 25 minutes at this point about it. It's amazing, obviously. Scorsese, De Niro, Keitel is just the acting, the obscure narrative that doesn't really push forward to the confrontation but drifts in the streamlike feeling. The cinematography is so beautiful, so many odd and obscure choices that Scorsese made. Bernard Herrmann's score fits perfectly, Jodie Foster's great, the Raymond Dad guy is great, De Niro is amazing, this is one of his most memorable performances, and that's saying a lot, because the guy's done a lot, man! Anyway, thank you for watching, and it really helped out if you guys could like, subscribe, and in the comments, tell me how I got all the facts wrong, and how my opinion is null and void. Thank you, and good night.